Hi everyone, welcome to the Louisiana Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative, last of our summer series webinars. And this one is based on silvopasture and silviculture, whichever is correct. I hope these guys will straighten out the correct term for that as we go along. We have with us kind of three different perspectives. First, we have Brian Risk, raise your hand, Brian. And Brian is actually a producer in Mississippi, south, Southeast Mississippi who is using um, silver pasture in an actual um, practical manner. So he's grazing it and using it. Um, Dr. Stefano here, raise your hand, is a uh, new to the Ag Center, I think as of this year or last year, am I right on that? Um, I was a grad student at LSU, so I'm not new but I'm new in the position. I was hired uh, past December, December 2022. Wonderful. So he is at the Hill Farm Research Station in Homer, Louisiana, which is through LSU Ag Center. And um, they have a some beautiful forested, forested land there, as well as used to have a silver pasture facility on site. And I'm interested to hear more about the status of that and where you guys are with that. And then, um, Rick Williams, are you on here, Rick? I, I think you are, but not with video. Yes, and uh, Rick is the state forester through NRCS, and he's gonna give us kind of the NRCS perspective of that as well. So I think we could start. Ellen, anything you'd like to add? No, that sounds great, Tara. Thank you all for coming. We are going to get started, I guess, um, if you guys would like to tell us a little bit. I think we can kind of get started. I don't have formal questions today, actually, because silver pasture is one of those things that I don't use. I don't know much about in my personal operation. And I thought that we could maybe start with Brian's perspective on how you came into this, where you use it, how you use it, and um and then maybe move into some definitions of what it is and the, some of the benefits. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to uh, start off by saying, uh, don't hold it against me that I'm in Mississippi. Um, I was actually a Louisiana native and an LSU grad, so uh, go Tigers. But uh, we bought some property here in uh, right outside Beaumont, Mississippi. Um, we bought 360 acres and started with beef cattle and just kind of stumbled, uh, luckily stumbled across the whole silvo pasture idea. Um, not by, not anything intentional. Um, there just happened to be a patch of woods on the property and, and we just kind of started utilizing it. And uh, we're still, we're still figuring it out. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a very, and I don't know how in depth you want me to go to start out with, but uh, I could give you just a general description of, of what we consider our silvo pasture area, um, if you want me to start with that. Okay, uh, so basically it's, it's 85 acres, um, and I don't know if we have time, I hate to waste too much time. Is there a way I could show you guys my screen where I could show you a Google Maps? Um, and kind of draw it out for you on that where you get a general idea of what I'm talking about. Yeah, Brian, yeah. if you if you go to the bottom toolbar, it should have a button that says share screen. Okay. And if you click that, it will show you a preview of other tabs on your computer and you can click a map or however you have it pulled up. Yeah, I think it's Safari. Let me try something here. Uh, <laughs> it just has little exclamation points. I don't know if it's, uh, that means it's not going to work or not. Hmm. Oh, if it's your first time using it, it might not be active in your settings. Okay. Um, well, we could just, uh, we could just skip it. I just thought it would be neat unless, unless we have time. I don't have copy, copy the link and put it in the chat and I can share it if you'd like. Okay. Well, it's just a, it's just a Google maps. I just kind of zoomed into our property to kind of, I don't know if it would actually pull up for you, but um, I'll just go ahead and kind of describe it to you. It's an 85 acre block. 
Um, the front, what I consider the front or the north 40 acres of it is planted pine trees. Um, the previous owner planted them at uh, 10 foot spacings and his intention was to bale pine straw. Um, I don't think he ever got around to it, um, but he was hoping to generate a little bit of revenue with some pine straw. And then back behind that 40 acres is actually a 16 acre pasture um, where, like I said, the previous owner was doing some uh, dove hunts and dove shoots um, and uh, sort of dual purpose. The trees on the north side kind of blocked the view from the highway where they could have uh, good hunts and get a little bit further off the highway. Um, we have another little block that kind of makes an L shape around that pasture. That's, uh, I would call it mostly volunteer, volunteer pines and uh, just whatever little bit of stuff that came up. And then there's another, let me see if I can find my notes. There's another couple acres, uh, about another 10 acres with some good hardwoods, kind of swampy hardwoods um with a pond we actually have two ponds i uh, there's one pond close to that front block and then another pond that has a little bit of swamp area around it um uh, mostly bahia grass out in the field bahia grass and a lot of kogan grass um that's something we had to learn about when we moved here um, we didn't know what kogan grass was until we moved here um that's been fun to deal with but uh I'd like to tell you a little bit about the wildlife in the, in the area because I think it's important. We have a small herd of deer. We keep about five to six does year round. Um, bucks are hard for us to keep. Uh, our neighbors take care of that for us. We have some lovely neighbors that like to take care of our bucks for us, but we keep does pretty well year round. Um, we have three or four turkeys that have made their home with us. Um, Plenty of rabbits and uh, plenty of coyotes. A couple foxes that we caught on camera, a bobcat or two. Um, I've had pictures of wood storks. Um, we've seen some egrets and blue herons. Um, and we have a really awesome, uh, really awesome herd of beavers. Uh, that is our our favorite animal. Uh, we have a lot of water that flows through our property and um, they keep us busy and on our toes trying to keep water flowing. Um, but uh, yeah, so we use those woods. I call them the lower woods because it is um, that side of our property is in a flood zone. Um, we're back water for the Leaf River. Um, so it will flood when the river gets up. Um, but we use the woods uh, year round. Um, I don't include them in any kind of grazing plan or grazing management. I don't uh, necessarily manage them and, and factor it in and say, okay, I'm going to include this in my rotation. I've always just left those woods as a, as a backup um, in times of drought, uh, in times of extreme cold. And actually right now, while it's, while it's hot, I actually put the cows down in there yesterday morning. Um, just cause it's, I mean, you can go down there and just feel the temperature difference, uh, in those trees compared to out in the field or even just under, you know, two or three shade trees. It's just so much cooler, but, uh, yeah, I don't know how much detail you want me to start with. Um, when we use them and how we use them, summer, winter. Uh, if you want me to keep going or if you want anybody else to chime in. Yeah, I'll tell you what, let's get into some specifics in just a moment. Let's go ahead and move to Dr. Stefano. I would love to hear, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, that's correct. Um, Silva oh, Pastor, uh, yeah, uh, he's a, uh, a practice of agro agroforestry. Agroforestry is a big name for uh, growing the trees and crop together. To me, it's a very interesting opportunities for um, ranchers and uh, whoever has a, a plot of forest land and is, and is not interested in just growing trees. Um, uh, 
uh, it's hard to uh, to talk to you without having like a specific plan, but I'll try to to cover as much as you, as you can. So you have two components here. We have actually more than two components. For uh, simplicity, let's think about it. You have the three component, you have the forage component, and you have the capital component. Uh, each of these components has a cost and benefits, right? So you grow three uh, to uh, for timber mainly. You have forage to feed the cattle, and then you use the cattle either for milk or meat or whatnot, right? And uh, from the design uh, to the very nitty gritty specific uh, is highly varied. It's according to the, the specific situation, the objective of the owners uh, or whatnot. Uh, as I say, there are costs uh, related to the establishment of a silvo pastor. You have a cost for establishing the trees and taking care of the trees because you need, uh, to, start, you need to plant the trees, you need to thin the trees, uh, you need herbicides, you need all these treatments. You have costs related to the forage, you have to establish the forage, um, and you have the cost of course from the uh, There are benefits, uh, benefits of diversified the production. So you don't have only one uh, output, you have several outputs. and uh, trees, timber, uh, cattle, forage, but also wildlife values. And Brian was uh, saying about he has deer, he has uh, several species of wildlife. These are important values, especially if you want to market it like they do in Texas. You want to sell a hunting license because you have a healthy piece of land, you have uh, the possibility. Also, you have a lot of ecological non-marketed uh, benefits, like the opportunity to restore a um, natural ecosystem. Uh, think about long-leaf pine. To me, long-leaf pine is the perfect system to implement a uh, silvopastor. Per se, a long-leaf pine is an open scenario, um, and under the, the open canopy, a lot of uh, native species, including grasses, legumes, grow naturally. Uh, they can be used as a forage for, uh, for cattle. Um, there are also uh, benefits related to the conservation of the soil, uh, water, carbon, a lot of ecological benefits. And if you have any questions, meanwhile, feel free to stop me, <laughs> you know. Um, and also, I was forgetting aesthetic. So it's a system that can be implemented successfully if the conditions uh, exist. Uh, and the willingness of the, the landowner, the owner, because uh, if you want to implement silvopastor, you want to do it. You don't expect to have uh, maximum production of timber and maximum production of forage at the same time. It's like, I don't know if you have uh, in mind those sliders, that you move one slider to the right, the other goes to the left and whatnot. There is a sweet spot in between. But uh, it can be an interesting opportunity and an interesting alternative. That is that is an excellent perspective on that of the, that there are trade offs for either one. So that's a, a very very good perspective and definition. And we'll dig more into that as well and come back to you, um, Dr. Williams. I, th I think you're Dr. or Rick Williams. We would love to hear from you as a state forester for NRCS. Hear your perspective on what is NRCS, you know, what is NRCS's perspective on silver pasture operations and what do you see benefits? Is it being done much in Louisiana? What are you seeing from your side? From, from the NRCS side, um, you know, we do have several that are going in the state. Uh, there's been some interest. Uh, in Louisiana, most of the individuals are similar to, to Brian in that they had pastures and cattle on part of their operation, and they had a pine plantation or some forested area adjacent to theirs that they wanted to incorporate into their grazing system. And using our assistance, uh, you know, to reduce the basal area, so we need to we need to get it where the forages will grow, you know, in the pine stands. Um, we we've assisted with 
uh, we have to look at what's there. They're all different. Can't just write a cookbook. Uh, some people have had timber sales and were able to remove their timber uh, through a harvest. And then we were able to come in and help them clean up the, the residuals, uh, yeah. the, the tops, uh, the woody debris left, the, the brush that's, that's, that's uh, in between uh, the alleyways under the other pine trees to allow the forages to come in. Some have had pine plantations. We were able to take out uh, multiple rows to create an alley with and then leave a couple rows that would be your pine stands. Um, so you have to work with each one is different. If we get in the pine stands too young, they have it pruned. Somebody might want to get into silver pasture earlier. Uh, there's going to be an additional step. They're going to need to prune their pine trees if we turn them loose and they've got green branches because they're going to have full sunlight. Those branches aren't going anywhere. Uh, in the sunlight. So they'll have to do a pruning step and we can help with pruning. Uh, and we've done that a couple of times uh, on different producers uh, properties because they wanted to get it established. So, you know, we have several that ones that's operational, but they're running uh, cattle and goats uh, on their in their place. Uh, we've got one um, in Natchitoches that's um, the producer will have to put a perimeter fence. Some of them have the perimeter fence, but it needs to be uh, kind of redone, checked out. It's been in the woods for years. So, you know, you need a good fence around it. Uh, we could assist with the, the watering systems, bringing in tanks and pipes and, and uh, heavy use pads uh, to get water systems into those areas. Uh, so we have a multitude of things that we can do. In, including planting desirable forages, either either native plants, uh, blue stems, uh, gamma grass, switchgrass, or we can do the introduced stuff, the Bahias and Bermudas, uh, depending on the site, the soils, and what the producer is uh, comfortable with, with doing, because they're going to end up implementing these things. So it needs to be somebody that's committed, and the ones that have done it really are. Uh, one of them, he's excited. He's well along the way. I've got a, a few slides I'll show of, of his initial work. He's further along than, we, than the slides I have. Um, there's there's um, one that's in Webster Parish and, and uh, very anxious to get the cows over into the, into the forested area. The perimeter fences are up. There's ponds in there. So the watering systems are in place. Um, that one still needed, uh, some of them burn it once the harvesting is done uh, to reduce some of that brush. We can, a lot of those things we can assist with, it just uh, is site specific of how we can target them. And, and uh, what I mean, assist, there's, there could be some uh, technical advice or they could get into the program and we could, you know, help them pay for those operations. I do have people that, Okay, maybe I can share my screen. I will do it. Click that green button. Yep, right at the bottom where it says share screen. It yep. should allow you to, as long as your settings aren't on private for your computer. Yeah, I'll see. Looks good. You see the pine trees? Yep. Okay, this is the process and they were hard. Rick, I accidentally muted you when I uh, was trying to mute myself. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're good on? now. Okay, this is the process though. This is when they started the, the, the harvesting operation. This pine stand it parallels his pasture. Uh, so you can see that when you're when you're dealing in a forest and you're going to silver pasture, there's a lot of stuff to deal with. It's not just remove a tree. You have grass and the cows can come in. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of effort. You can see the woody understory that needs to be done and all the tops. Uh, I can move to the next one. Slide should go. Okay. See, we, they cut alleys through it. Uh, which are going to be nice. And then there's 
like a 50 foot swath of trees uh, with that 40 basal area. So you can see there's going to be a lot of sunlight coming into this stand. Uh, there's still a lot of stuff to deal with. And uh, the last slide here, you can see it's, it's getting there. And we still might have to come back with a spray. I mean, we've got roots. You've got stumps that are going to be cut off. So, you know, it's a pro you have to be upfront with them of how this is going to get to the silva pasture from their current forested area. Uh, the perimeter fence is around. You can see the adjacent property. Um, and the water troughs have been run into this area uh, from his adjacent pasture pipes. They were just extended on and uh, to bring tanks and stuff into this area. And then we will evaluate to see what kind of forages are coming in. The benefits is like you mentioned, it's a lot better for the cattle to stand in here in the shade and feed than to stand out in that open pasture when it's 102 degrees and try to be comfortable. Uh, very few of us could be comfortable out there when it's 100 degrees. So an excellent time to use this. And then again, the winter time when those cold winds are coming, uh, there's a little terrain in here, a little topography, the adjacent forest. Uh, they can get out of the cold winds uh, and, and have a good place to uh, to graze and, and, and spend their time and become part of the rotation, part of their management system. Uh, this is not just where they put cows and leave them. Uh, this just becomes part of their management system. Part of the time they're in the pastures, uh, when that's the beneficial part, and part of it will be into the areas that they've created uh, for a silver pasture. And, and I will stop sharing. That's what I had on that one. So I'm back. Everybody's back. So I'll stop with that. And if somebody has questions, I'll try to answer them as best I can on that. That is so great. And when you're referring to that, uh, that NRCS can help with that, is that within the EQIP program or another program? Primarily the equip, uh, there, and Cody might chime. There may be something that we have in our conservation stewardship program. Um, you know, once everything is in place and things are functioning, uh, our conservation stewardship program, uh, you know, usually helps producers move it up another step, move the conservation efforts forward a little bit. And uh, but the ones that I was talking about. Uh, we're primarily through our environmental quality program, our equip program. I wanted to mention also, if you guys, you attendees have questions along the way for anyone, you can mark those in the chat and we will have time for question and answer toward the end. We don't have a specific time limit on this. Ellen, did you have a question? I actually have a question for the audience. I was wondering if anyone on this call is currently implementing silo pasture. Maybe just some interested parties. I was curious to see if anyone wanted to share their experience as well. Ellen, we, uh, in the application for our EQIP program, this past year for our farm, one of our leases has a section of pine trees that are probably 10 to 15 years old. They're not very large, but they're really tight and really brushy. And so that's where it kind of piqued my interest as well to find out more about silver pasture because it's an important thing for us to know for a lot of different reasons. And I'm gonna delve into those questions later about why I think silver pasture is so important. Um, Dr. Williams, is it um, these these cost sharing programs are actually helping with the clearing of the pine trees and the thinning and all the prep as well? Or well, there's it's, there's a pavement to go from the, the woods you have to the open conditions. So there is a pavement. Um, this one, the one we looked at, you know, he moved some of the trees with a timber sale, and then he used our dollars to do the understory cleanup. Uh, we do have a pine plantation uh, about your age that you were talking about up in uh, Bossier Parish. 
and he used it to hire the mulcher to remove. Uh, we removed three rows of trees and left two. So then you've got a, a alleyway gap for the forages to come, and then you've got two rows of trees. And if we do the the, the tree count, we're still running at 40 basal area. So when we, we do our count, we're gonna we're gonna try to target to get 40, 50 basal area is the residual. That's a pretty open pine stand. Uh, normal pine stands are probably running, you know, 15, probably 120 up to 140 basal area. That's how much square foot of wood is on an acre. So you're going from over a hundred down to 40. So you're, you're really creating some space uh, that those forages are, we don't usually thin that hard, but because we're doing silver pasture and we want to get forages growing, we're opening them up more. And so, you know, some places removed every other road that closes up too fast. But to the adjacent trees will close the gap, you know. So you got to make it wide enough so that when the adjacent trees grow and their limbs are, are going to start expanding into that sunlight, that it doesn't shade out your forage area. So that's why we're removing three or four rows of trees and then we're leaving uh, two or three rows of trees. And each one can be different. We can, we can pattern them to, that fits the property. Uh, but we want to make it where, you know, we're, we still have the trees, still got trees that we can manage and grow, and we've got places for the forage, and then your cattle can use it. Did that answer the question? It did. It certainly did. Um, Dr. Stefano, do you have recommendations from your perspective on kind of the best timing as far as if you're is there a great ideal time to convert forested land to a silver pasture? Is it better to start from bare land and create silver pasture from that? What's kind of the best process to make that happen in your opinion? It depends on your situation. If you have to start from scratch, so you have no tree, there is a lot of cost up front because you have um, Preparation for the soil, getting the, seed, the, the trees, planting the trees, uh, herbicide release, um, all these costs have to be factoring. If you have uh, already trees in your land, uh, you need to, to harvest those trees in the right way to create uh, forage alleys. It might or might not be cheaper. Uh, I have some numbers to give you, and the cost of establishing a silver pasture is 100 to 150 um, dollars per acre, uh, country-wise. It also depends on if you want to do fire breaks, uh, what kind of uh, uh, forage you want to put. So there is not a unique uh, answer. It's highly dependent on your situation. And I hope my mic is working now. I try to check. If not, let me know. So to sum up, it depends on your scenario. There is not a, a wrong time or a right time. It's highly dependent on your situation. And situation can vary uh, from case to case. And you said you had some numbers put together. So do you feel like this is a profitable you know, is it profitable on both sides? I know that, um, you know, you guys described it as a slider bar. I guess, you know, it depends on what you want to do, but do you feel like this is actually profitable or is it kind of halfway doing both? Um, I have a number for that too. There is an internal rate of uh, interest, which is 13.4% calculated by a study. So technically it is. But uh, it's, uh, you have to understand you have a short-term cash flow, which is given by uh, cattle, by uh, animals, and forage, and a long-term cash flow. And you have to, to factor in. If you're familiar with finance and mathematics, that will help, because uh, you're growing trees, something you won't get uh, right now, but uh, you will get them later in time. So it can be profit, profitable if done in the, in the right way. And yes, of course, I can put the numbers. I also have some um, files I can share with you, some papers and some manuals I can share in the chat so you guys can uh, can read and uh, read more about Silvopastor if you want. 
That would be a wonderful resource. And one of our um, participants would like also those numbers that you mentioned in a word or PDF. You know, one of one of the things that we have we promote from Louisiana Grazing Plans is the, the opportunity to stack enterprises. Brian, can you tell us a little bit about your hopes or you know, does this increase the ability for you to stack enterprises in your operation? Um, yeah, up until now it hasn't. Um, like I said, we've just kind of left those woods as and I hate to even call them this, but it's kind of the term I've used, um, just a dumping ground. Uh we're not we're not cutting our own hay anymore but when we were cutting our own hay i'd turn the cows down in those woods for a week or two let a couple fields grow up um to cut for hay um i you know and the reason why i call the a dumping ground well it's the lower part of my pasture and i would just kind of i just dump them down there and i'd forget about them i'd put them over there forget about them concentrate on hay um now that we're not uh cutting our own hay um our herd hasn't expanded much, well, really not any in the past four years or so. We've kind of stayed right around. We have about 50 a year. Um, we're sort of in a position to start expanding, but we're also uh, planning on uh, marketing some of our own beef. Um, and uh, we, are, we would like to. We did one this year as a test run. It had a lot of, a lot of success, a lot of, a lot of good feelings about it. But um, we would like to do everything grass fed and grass finished. Um, and we are aware that to keep that many animals on our property for that long, um, you know, it takes a little bit longer to finish an animal out on grass. Um, we are going to need some additional pasture. So developing and, and better utilizing that area and actually including it in, in a grazing plan is something we really plan on working on the, in the next couple of years. Um, and that's going to come in a, a couple of different forms. Um, some fencing, uh, you know, like I said, it was, it's an 85 acre block. So when, when we turn the cows down there, it's not it's not controlled. It's not managed. The cows just kind of go where they want. It's really interesting. They make a uh, they make a little circle every day. Um, they'll kind of start out on this spot and then they'll move to this spot mid morning, move over close to this pond about lunchtime, and make another little loop and kind of wind up right back where they started, which has created some lanes and some cow trails and uh, some muddy areas uh, since we're not able to rotate those pastures. So. Um, Future plans are, are really, uh, you know, we have a lot of ideas um, that we would like to get to in the next couple of years. I'm not quite to the point of, of thinning any of our trees and, and opening it up anymore yet. I would like to kind of just manage what we have now uh, the way it is with, uh, we would like to do more uh, with water um, right now we have uh, an artesian well um, and we just have a big water trough sitting next to the artesian well. Um, of course, when we start cross fencing, I would like uh, to branch that out and I would like to leave it um, artesian without a pump if we can. Um, Cause it, it carries that well in particular carries a pretty good bit of pressure just on its own. Um, and then, I'd, of course, I'd like to do all the normal fencing out my swamps. I'd like to keep, keep the cows out of the wet areas and keep the cows out of the ponds. Um, but, yeah, all that comes with time. But we're really making some plans on incorporating that part of our property into our actual plan, not just as a, not just as a something extra that we like to use when, it, you know, when it's convenient or, or when it benefits us to use it. And Brian, how long have you had this farm? Uh, we've been here, oh, we bought it in 2015, so almost eight years now. Okay, so it's somewhat new to you. I'm sure no farm is ever complete with all the projects that we think up, but, you know, it's one of those things, it sounds like it was on the back burner and now it's becoming more on the forefront, right? Right, yeah, definitely. That's an excellent way to describe it. Um, and uh 
I listened to a podcast a couple of weeks ago about, uh, and I'm terrible with names. It was about a guy in the uh, down in Mexico in the uh, Chihuahua, Chihuahua and Chihuahuan desert. Um, and, and he kind of talked about, you know, don't go to the worst part of your property and start develop, developing it because uh, you're going to get frustrated. You're not going to see results. We've really focused on our improved pastures and, and getting our watering points and our grazing management down in those pastures in the last eight years. And, and uh, yeah, we plan on moving out now, moving particularly into that block of, of woods to do something a little bit more with. And, and one more question for you, Brian. You might have mentioned this already, and I might have missed it, but I know in person we've talked about this. How many days of the year can you graze that spot? Oh, um, realistically, it can be grazed um, without any kind of introduced, you know, planted species, planted grasses. I could graze it year round, uh, 365 days a year. So, of course, the summertime, is lush with bahia grass and and everything um there's a little mixture of everything down there um and in the winter time uh the trees are dense enough that the bahia grass actually stays green almost year round i mean it might i think this year that uh we had a pretty hard freeze um that got it. I mean, it takes a pretty good 25, 24 degrees to get the grass, the bahia grass in those trees. Um, so we, we utilize it in the winter time. I'll use it as a, um, so I'll actually use it twice. Um, if you want to relating to winter. So I'll put the cows in those woods while I'm stockpiling, um, my bahia grass in my pastures. And then as I'm utilizing the stockpile in my pastures, because it stays so green and so shaded that uh, the grass in that area will actually grow back and I'll come back to it again, um, middle of winter, December, January as a stockpile. Um, and then after that, this year was the first year I planted some ryegrass and clover in the field. Um, uh, there's a 15, 16 acre field out in the middle of it. This was the first year I actually planted it um, and utilized it in the spring. Most of the time in the spring, I'm, I'm on my permanent pastures on, on rye grass and clover, but we actually used it and actually needed it this year in particular because it was such a rough year for growing winter forage. Um, the rye grass and the clover really shined in that uh, kind of uh, protected environment, if you want to call it that. Our, our biggest issue in the wintertime is uh, wetness. So of course it gets wet and uh, that is a wet natured area of our property, especially with being shaded. And um, so I, I have to be careful how much I use it in the wintertime because um, the cows, like I said, they'll make their little loop every day. And if they make that loop and it's raining, uh, they make a pretty good mess. So we try and time it in between dry spells, if it gets dry for a few days, we'll utilize it. Um, and then flooding, we have to be careful. Uh, if it's going to flood, it's going to flood between January and April. So we kind of have to watch the river and watch our weather. Um, but yeah, yeah, 365 days a year. It's, I love it. There's always something. If the bahia grass isn't green, there's something else green in there for them to eat. There's always something green. So what a valuable resource for you to have something green year round. I mean, even they, we yeah. say that we can get that in Louisiana, but it's almost still without planting something, it's almost unachievable as well. What about you two other guys? Do you see any, um, that same thing happening in, in plots that you've seen as far as time of grazing or are natives doing better or planted forages doing better? What are you guys seeing on your end? Dr. DeStefano, Dr. Rick. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, are you seeing that same thing? Um, any any silver pasture plots that you're seeing or, or, or know about, you know, of being able to graze year round versus, you know, or longer grazing periods?
And I agree with Brian. Technically, you can graze um, year round. There are variables uh, that have to be considered, um, but technically, you can you can go there year round. Uh, also, it depends on your forage and uh, the way you, um, you you balance uh, warm season and cold season grasses. But on paper, yes, you can go year round. Another thing I wanted to add that uh, you can add fire, a prescribed burn as a tool to improve your uh, your forage scenario. So keep that in mind. Uh, fire and pine silviculture, they go hand in hand. And uh, fire, prescribed burn, and uh, silver pine sil silvopastor are very compatible. And, and to expand on that conversation, this is Rodney from the Leaf Center. Uh, either Dr. Stefano or, or uh, Dr. Rick, if, if y'all could elaborate a little bit more on putting fire in a graze system as a temporary setback. Um, you're probably going to want a rotation and move on to another track, uh, another compartment, and let your system recover. You know, that resting period is important in grazing, but it's also a recovery period with the burning. Um, from, from a cattle per acre standpoint man that changes the whole philosophy where a bahia pasture can carry so much more than that native grass pasture that you're burning which we we've had some native um bahia stuff that as we burn it we get more blue stem coming into it and that might be a little residual uh, in, in times where that bahia is not doing so well but one one blue stem is not going to satisfy a cow. There's got to be a diversity there. So I know the fire is going to be a setback. Is there any recommendation on if you take 40 acres of natives, what is it going to equal to in Bahia? I don't have an answer on the moment, but I can look uh, and see what I can call it. We, we've got a seven acre old relic of a pasture that I anticipate uh, Argentine, I think it's an Argentine Bahia coming back. So there's probably, it's gonna be burned on a regular basis, but I got a feeling that as the cows start to graze it, it may kind of convert itself back to the pasture grasses, which with our longleaf is gonna compete a little bit. We've got young longleaf in it now. But um, we've got a five acre pasture next to it that is full out Bahia. We actually make hay off of it. So I think we're gonna be okay, but we'll probably have to do a grazing plan, which I recommend if, if somebody's gonna do something similar. Um, five acres of Bahia versus seven acres of natives. Uh, there's a fair amount of difference there that, that math don't compute too well to a certain number of cows. As far as burning goes, is there a specific time of the year that it's recommended to burn? I'm pretty sure at the same time you, you burn up pine plantation. So early spring, starting from February, if the conditions are right. So I guess the, the same rule applies for silvopastor. With us and young longleaf, we'll, we'll be burning pretty much wintertime, dormant season. But I haven't figured out how to promote these winter grasses, some of the cool season grasses. If that's going to be a late November, early December burn, um, at, at some point the Bahia plays out, and then I'm going to need to shift them over to that native, hopefully with some cool season grasses. So I've considered, do I supplement with cool season grasses and a planting one year after a burn? Or do I just let them go and see what happens and see how well they do? I wish I could, I wish I could chime in on the whole burning topic, but uh, we've, we've wanted to burn our woods uh, for years. Uh, but to be completely honest, I'm scared to death of it. Uh, 
I looked at hiring somebody to come do it for me and didn't want to pay what, what they wanted to charge me to cut the fire. I mean, they were going to do it all um, and didn't want to pay that. Uh, but, and I don't want to take away from burning at all, but in my experience with uh, cattle grazing, the cows do, do just as good of a job um, as, as, you know, as any kind of fire would. Um, of course, the cows aren't going to eat all the brush, but uh, go, in our situation from, a, from an area that was kind of left vacant and unmanaged to us starting to utilize it, the cows have cleaned those woods up uh, tremendously just with periodic grazing. Um, the cows have done an excellent job and, and we haven't touched it with fire a single time. Um, but, uh, yeah, fire is a good tool, but, um, the cows do cows doing, um, I don't know if there's anybody, uh, when you talk about silver pasture, a lot of times you hear cows and cows and woods, cows and trees. Um, if the trees are big enough and already established, uh, I think some goats and sheep, um, would be an excellent, um, addition to that and we're actually planning on getting a few sheep um in the next few weeks and we're gonna kind of they're not gonna go in the woods to start with um but curious to see what, what they do uh down there in the future You know, one of my first Louisiana grazing lands things that I ever went to was a fellow from, I believe, South Africa, uh, Ian Mitchell Ennis, and he was talking about whenever people need to clear cut land or rejuvenate forested land back into pasture of really tightly grazing cattle in there and doing a similar, um, similar like you're talking about, Ryan. But I was wondering, Dr. Williams, I know what you showed in your pictures, you know, there were obviously some logs on the ground and uh, um, how can we best manage those logs in that kind of situation? Is fire really the answer for that, the best answer? I had to find my mute button. Um, fire, fire's not gonna get rid of all those logs uh, but because of the it's going to take multiple burns to get rid of those. So hopefully the cleanup period, if you've got some loose ones or whatever, and you can get those to the side or you can get those to a pile, um, if, if you're not getting them mulched up very well, um, it's going to take a, a, a good, a pretty risky day to burn, to burn up a, a stem that size um, before it will, it will disintegrate. Uh, multiple burns would get to them. So, you know, bringing fire into the, into the system uh, can be good, uh, but, you know, you're not going to need it as often as, as, uh, as somebody managing for, for wildlife habitat or one of those other uh, issues that you might want to bring fire into a system because you do have the cattle uh, that are going to be periodically grazing that site. Uh, that, that they're going to do a, a lot of, of uh, browsing on some of the native stuff that are coming up, even some of the shrubs that are in there. Uh, but I know that uh, formerly at, at Hill Farm, Terry Clayson and then burned a lot in their civil pastures, especially where they had the uh, switchgrass. And some of those, I've got a lot of slides of, of burning those areas off and letting that come back. Uh, you know, after the after the burn, so the fire can uh, reduce the thatch. It's going to stimulate some growth. It's going to put some nutrients in. It's going to be a period of time, uh, uh, like Brian DeVos mentioned, that you're going to have to delay having your cattle in there. So the cattle may come off of it. If they come off in in the the winter and are going back into the pastures, there could be a window of time there. Now we can get this burnt. We can leave it set. It's going to grow up in the spring uh, and, and kind of be ready for the next time we need to bring the cows back into it. So it's, it, it's going to be a really a management and time and effort. Uh, you're going to have to have your fire breaks in place. 
uh, which which we can have and in uh, in Louisiana a landowner could burn but we really like to have certified burners involved on the sites uh, with a good burn plan of, of when we're burning and what we're trying to accomplish uh, but you know, I've got lots of slides of burning and the vegetation that comes back from it uh, but if you if you got to where you're burning a very open pine stand and it's primarily got grasses and stuff under it and those grasses dry up in the winter time but you don't want you can't be burning them when they're green so the grasses have to have had the frost brown them up so the grasses aren't actively growing on the surface got fuel enough that, that can carry a fire so there has to be enough coverage out there that that when you light the fire it can carry across the site so if the cows grazed it to you know bare dirt it's going to be hard to, to put fire into that uh, without having to walk around and try to hit little patches of grass so it's, it's going to be a time of thing and when you got your animals off you left enough uh, cover on the site that's going to carry a fire and, and then a time of thing to let that heal back and uh and, and restore your, your, your grass community back to it. But it's definitely a good tool. Uh, and, you know, it is successfully used. Uh, but our silver pastures that we're having now, we're, 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 we're not near that phase. We're, we're in the phase of getting it established. Trees are being removed. We're working on the forages. That's way down the road when we start incorporating. That's that, like I said, those additional practices that you can come back with with the conservation stewardship program. If you if we wanted to bring fire into the system, uh, reevaluate the site and see if that would be uh, something that would be beneficial. But yeah, it's it is a risk, and then uh, you know uh, putting fire in there. There are a lot of grasses that benefit from burning. Um, but um, you can do it with, with managing with your cattle and if necessary, uh, maybe a herbicide application to get rid of unwanted plants that may be popping up when the cows are all out in the pasture. Dr. Williams, our, um, within the resource concerns of NRCS, is silver pasture high, medium, low on those resource concerns? Um, I don't know where it's falling. Cody might have an idea, but the ones that have applied for it have been, uh, the, the few that have applied have been getting funded. Um, and it's been in multiple offices uh, across the state. Um, like I said, we have um, one in, in the Felicianas. We got another one north of uh, East Baton Rouge Parish. It's, it's looking at several pasture. We got one in Bossier. Uh, Webster Parish. We had one in uh, Union Parish that's probably a lot further along, and, and we're not having anything active with them uh, at the time. And um, and then one in Natchitoches. And what happens when the neighbors see, wait a minute, I got a pine stand and I'm right by my cows. That's where we get more interest is somebody sees what they're doing and say, wait a minute. And they're looking at their stand and, and saying, I could expand my. my cattle herd I could use my land a little bit more in a different way uh, and so you know those are the ones that uh, have been interested in it so currently it's been one that's not starting from scratch they've got cows in a pasture or something beside them they're already in the operation um, one of them her daddy planted all the trees and she likes cows so it's kind of a terror we don't want to just take all the trees out uh, Daddy planted them, so we're going to manage them as a silver pasture and still have trees, but expand the cattle operation. That's kind of the, where we've been so far. Uh, it's, it, it would be a big step for somebody to come buy a pan plantation and say, "I want to run silver pasture." Uh, be a lot of effort and upfront to get that uh, up and going. It can be done, but it'd be a lot of effort to get that up and going. Most of them have something going already, and we're just adding to it. And what a neat way to stack operations and to add to your 
your land value, and also what a way to, um, in in the efforts to preserve grazing lands, to do to really get the both best of both worlds. It's kind of my thought process. You know, you, I was really impressed years and years ago whenever I went to the Hill Farm Research Station and saw the silver pasture operation there. And I wanted to ask uh, Dr. DeStefano, you know, you're new to the position, but are there plans or hopes to research silver pasture there at the Hill Farm in the future or now? Yes, uh, we are actually cutting our stand, silver pasture stand we had because it's long, long overdue. But yes, we, uh, me personally, uh, my idea is to implement uh, silver pasture and other agroforestry practices. And uh, I don't have a clear plan at the moment, it's in the embryo, but yes, definitely. That's exciting news. And whenever you get that together, we would certainly love to schedule a pasture walk or during the process, even before it's put together, it would be neat to see kind of a before and after process as well to document. I think we are at a good point now where we could take questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question? You can certainly just unmute and ask your question. Or if you guys, your speakers have anything more to add. Brian, did you have more to add about your operation? I don't think so. I think we pretty well covered everything. I could, well, I, I guess I could flip through my notes and make sure I did. Um, yeah, just some, uh, I don't know if you want to consider, call them management considerations, things that we've noticed um, in the summertime. Uh, and I don't know if this is more so because uh, the density of our of our woods, or or if this is common in in the more open areas, if you want to call it a an actual, I don't want to say what we have is an actually silvo pasture. Um, I just I don't necessarily define it that way because I I still feel like the woods are a little too dense to technically call it that. But uh, in the summertime, um, deer flies and mosquitoes for us in particular. Um, are a lot worse down there. Um, and the deer flies, of course, don't last all summer. Um, they kind of come and go in waves. So we, we try and kind of, well, what I did, uh, let's see, today's Wednesday. What I did Monday, I rode down there Monday evening and just kind of got out in the middle of the woods and waited five, 10 minutes and, um, didn't have any deer flies jump on me. So I said, okay, well, let's go ahead and turn the cows in here. Um, while it's hot, but there are certain times where you can't hardly stop uh, stop for 10 seconds before a bunch of deer flies jump on you. And, and we try and avoid, um, avoid that area during those times just for the comfort of the cattle, but it, it doesn't last long. It's not all summer long. It's, uh, you know, it goes in little waves, little short periods of time. Um, and of course, in the winter time, our, our other management consideration in the winter time is just the wetness, and uh, of course, hunting. I mean, we want to we want to hunt on our land as well, so um, we utilize that area as much as we can in the winter time. But uh, we like to leave it for some recreation, and that's one of the reasons why I haven't spent a whole lot of time and and energy just completely going in there and clearing up the whole area and developing it because it does have a lot of value to us um, recreationally. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think that pretty well covers it. Uh, we love that. We love that part of our property. Um, we've been just to give a quick little plug here. We've been trying to follow regenerative agricultural practices for the past four or five years. And um, that block uh, that block down there is, is nature's regenerative agriculture. It's diverse. Um, it's green. There's living roots in the, in the ground all year long and, and it does it all on its own. Uh, it's re it's just a really cool area. We love it. Uh, the cows always come out doing well. Um, I think they do better in there than they do in the improved pastures. Uh, 
it's just a really cool, really cool area to be able to use. And lucky that uh, I wish I could sit here and tell people what it takes to develop a silvo pasture. Um, but we just stumbled across it. We got lucky that the property we bought had it. And uh, we're just glad to be able to use it. Thank you, Brian. What about you, Dr. Stefano? Stefano, do you have anything to add that we didn't cover? Uh, not really, but if you have any questions, feel free to contact me anytime. Could you put your email and contact information in our chat for today? Oh, I will. I will. I will in a moment. That would be wonderful. Thank you. And then, Dr. Rick, what about you? Okay, I, I'm digging through some archives here. So I'm going to do a couple of screens for you. Um, did that one show? Share. Looks good. Burning in the silver pasture. I'm going to stop sharing that one. And I'm going to go to another one. Did it come up? You see the pine stand that's been burnt? Yep, looks good. I won't go the other way, not to the donkeys. There it comes back after the fire. Lots of natives and stuff. Uh, and Dr. Stefano may see find some of these. These were some of the old hill farm stuff uh, that Terry Clayson had up there, and a lot with the uh, switchgrass and, and stuff on that area that's up there. So there's there's lots of tools out there uh, that that. You know, everybody's going to need to come and and walk on the property, look at the property, see where you're at, how old are your pines, what's the competing vegetation, what's there now, and, and how do we move it forward to, to look more like uh, one of the silver pasture operations, um, meeting the benefits of, of having trees and, and having forages and being able to utilize this part of your property for uh, you know, grazing and, and still having wildlife habitat and stuff out there. So anybody that's interested, you know, uh, first steps would be to come into one of our field offices and if they're not comfortable, then they call us and, and we schedule times and we will actually go with them on the property. And, and uh, it's, it's usually me and the grazing person because there's, there's two aspects that we're looking at. Uh, and forage people. So, you know, we're trying to tackle those multiple things as we examine a piece of property. Uh, the trees, getting the space, getting forages, and uh, what else is going to be necessary uh, so that you can come in and, and graze that property. But thank y'all for having me on and be happy to uh, answer questions now or in the future. If you got a question, feel free to contact me and, and uh, be happy to help. Dr. Williams, we would love your information in the chat as well. And I was wondering if people reach out, if people are looking for technical assistance, suppose they have a plot of pine trees and they want to, to consider changing it over. You mentioned going into the field office. Are there any strings attached with going into a field office? And, and you guys as well, Dr. DiStefano, are there other resources that people should look at as well or, or read up on, for, especially for Louisiana and the Deep South? There's no strings to come in and, and, and get technical assistance. Uh, we can go on the property. We can write a we can write a plan up for you. We can give you some of the same ideas of activities that you could do. You can do them all yourself. Uh, you know, if you don't want to cross over and get uh, involved in in a, one of our programs, uh, but we still can do all the technical stuff the same as somebody that is uh, wanting to do one of the programs. So there's would be no string attached. You'd have the information 
uh, as many resources as we could find, who else uh, that you might contact, uh, like the uh, Dr. DeStefano at Hill Farm, uh, some of the other producers that may be out there that could, that, uh, that we could get information from. Plus there's a lot of uh, information from the uh, research center in Nebraska uh, that we have a lot of information on on agroforestry and silver pasture operations. Uh, we could pull pamphlets and handouts and information for them. And I agree with Dr. Williams. Uh, feel free to call me, email me. I will be happy to cooperate with you. I share some resources. I want to uh, point to one uh, in particular, which is the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry. Uh, University of Missouri is the leader uh, for agroforestry, including silvopastor in the country. So that's a very good one. Rodney from the Leaf Center, did you have anything you'd like to add on, on silvopasture? I'm just looking forward to it growing. I want to get those trees up out of the ground and get it to where I can put a few cows on it. Just looking forward to it. I do have to herbicide a little bit. We had uh, that seven acres had to be mulched, uh, a big portion of it. So those plants are, are coming right back. Um, but I have some options on a low impact herbicide that can be applied just directly to that to the plant. So it's going to require a little backpack. Um, so it's a little bit of work ahead of us, but uh, it's the trees are there, they survived, and um, we just got to build fence and put some plumbing in to get us some troughs going. So, so that's about it. It's um it's coming along, but that's seven acres, that other 40 acres, it it's got a pond and needs fence on it, but I'm not gonna be doing any backpacking on it. I'm gonna let the fire take care of it. So we'll be doing fire two years in a row. And you know, that's why I kind of elaborate on the setback is. I told the guy that we're probably going to lease to is look on the years that we burn, which for a while might be every two years, depending on what your cows do. You know, if they do their job, we'll extend that to maybe four or five years. There, there's a good period of time where you can ease up on the burning and let the cows do the work for you. But at some point, you know, we have to be careful. We have to watch that and uh, pay attention to the vegetation. So that's going to require me and him both kind of understanding where the cows are spending their time and what they're actually taking out of the system. And uh, sometimes that fire will promote good things. Sometimes it takes out good things. So we just have to be careful with it. And learn, learn it as we go. It's not, it's not a perfect system. Certainly appreciate all the added information. It's always good to hear another conversation about silver pasture. Judging by the interest, it looks like we do need to schedule a pasture walk soon in a silver pasture operation or agroforestry operation. So this is a wonderful webinar today, guys. We really appreciate all of your efforts. If I could give you an applause, I know everyone would join in because you guys have done a great job of giving us three different perspectives on this. I am so excited as far as what this opens doors in in Louisiana. Um, succession is one of my passion projects personally, as far as land being passed down. And I think this just opens up a lot of doors for succession and rejuvenation of forested land in different ways, re using forested land in different ways. And it just opens up a lot of doors for new farmers or existing farmers to, to change their direction or add an operation. So lots of exciting stuff and I think we're headed in a great direction with this and look forward to Louisiana Grazing Lands providing even more technical assistance and networking in this realm. Now I believe if we don't have any further questions that we have a drawing from all of our attendees today from Bethany, our intern.
So our prizes are first a t-shirt. Um, we will need your size and your address, your mailing address. So the iPhone, I'm not sure who that was. And then Trent, same for you. If you could put in the chat your address, that would be amazing. And I also would love to have, uh, looks like iPhone has a question about growing cover crop seeds for orchard grazing. Any of you guys have any, any perspective on grazing an orchard? That's a that's a different perspective on a civil pasture or agroforestry operation. Dr. DeStefano, do you maybe have anything on that? Technically, it's, it's feasible. That's been done since forever in agriculture. Uh, I don't have the, the technical details, but on paper, it's doable. I think about my grandpa in Italy. He left the chicken and sheep and goat out in the in the orchard so yeah on paper yes but uh, i'm not uh, an agronomist uh, by training but i guess it's possible was that a did you have specific questions about the um cover crop seeds on preparation of your soil or anything to that effect or using fire All right. Well, I'm sure that there, this will open up lots more questions for us to, to continue addressing on, and we'll definitely continue on that. Um, for now, we're going to make sure and get our addresses for the people who won the door prizes, and we really appreciate all the attendance today. This has been recorded, and we will have this on our um, YouTube channel for future reference for everyone. Oh, look questions about seeds or crops that are beneficial for both pecan trees and cows. That is the question. Ah, kind of a multi-species approach that's beneficial for pecan trees and cows. And we may not have that person on this call at this moment. Um, is Cody still on? Cody Moe is our state grazing specialist, and hey. he would be a great one. There you are. Hey, hey. Tara. I've been, uh, yeah, I've been here, just been sitting in the background. Um, no, it's, <laughs> good. A, it's a good comment. Um, you know, I would suggest that, um, you know, any kind of leguminous plant that we can intercede into those uh, pecan groves, pecan orchards, uh, would benefit from fixing some um, fixing some nitrogen from the legumes and then providing a good forage um, you know, for those cows in between, um, you know, so interceding some some legumes into that pecan orchard would probably work pretty good to have a multi benefit. Right. Yep, winter peas too, winter peas, cow peas in the summer. Yeah, mm -hmm. any kind of leguminous plant in there would would probably work pretty good. And in diversity, I would think diversity is a big ticket for success in a lot of ways, especially in a grazing program. Um, and I know you're grazing dairy cows generally, and uh, diversity can, can be a really huge ticket. Brian, you have anything on that? Uh, yeah, I was going to go... Um... I was going to go with the same legumes, clovers. Uh, we do uh, uh, our winter mix is ryegrass, uh, ladino clover, arrowleaf clover, um, crimson clover, and a redland clover. So we, we plant quite a few different varieties of clover, and they all have different maturity dates. So they, the, they kind of benefit us at different times. The crimson clover is going to be your earliest fastest growing but earliest maturing 
um, followed by probably the arrow leaf and then the Kinlan red and uh, the Louisiana S1 or some kind of white Ladino white clover. Um, we're actually, believe it or not, um, it's hundred gonna be a hundred degrees and we're still grazing Kinlan red and uh, our white clovers right now. I mean, we still have clover. It's, um, I love clover. It's easy to seed. We've drilled it. We've lightly scratched it. We've thrown it on top of the ground. Um, it's, it's so easy. The peas are going to have to be drilled or disked, either one. Um, clover is just so easy to plant. Uh, I'm not hearing a whole lot of good reports about the prices of clover this winter. Um, we might have to back up and reevaluate, but uh, we'll just have to see. But yeah, I like, I like clover and ryegrass just for the ease of planting. Well, if y'all have any further questions, y'all can always reach out via email and all the speakers have put their information in the chat. Um, like Tara said earlier, this is recorded, so it'll be on YouTube. If you'd like to share it with friends or rewatch it, we would really appreciate it. Um, and you will be receiving an email after the fact with the follow-up survey, which would really help if you could complete for our grant that has sponsored all of these webinars this summer. Um, and we will try to also include all of those PDFs that Dr. DiStefano sent us, which I think are really great resources. Um, but with that, uh, this actually concludes our five-part summer webinar series. All five are on our YouTube channel if you missed any or want to watch them again. Um, and we hope to see you guys soon for our next webinar series, which isn't scheduled yet, but we will definitely continue because these have been very successful and have simulated great conversation.